Thank you very much also to, I think, for Workforce Ministries for sponsoring the dinner and for the work that you're doing for Lou and the rest of the team. It's a remarkable ministry and it's wonderful to see uh, how that is uh, flourishing and helping us all in the, in the workplace. Now, as some of you may know, um, this is the, um, the first time that uh, I've been to this church. This is the first time I've spoken uh, in, uh, in what I call Washington, but I understand it's not Washington now. Um, and uh, I, was thinking, I was reminded of the story of uh, the opera singer who was taken for the first time uh, to sing in one of the great Italian opera houses. As you know, the Italians take their opera quite seriously, and he sang this great aria, and at the end of the aria, there were cries of, encore, encore, so he sang it again. And then uh, further cries of, encore, encore, so he sang the aria again. When this carried on for the third time, he said, uh, look, thank you very much, you do me a great honor, but this, uh, if I don't uh, go on, we will never get through the opera. When a man stood up in the balcony and said to him, you uh, sing it again and again until uh, you get it right. <laughs> so there are dangers to a first-timer. I'm also reminded, as you know, I've written a book called oh, I Was Bullied by My Pastor. Funny how the vicars or the pastors always bully, bully people to do things. I'm sure it never happens here. Um, to write a book called God at Work. And the other day, a young analyst in the bank was told that he needed to come to see me. And um, the, um, turned to the analyst next to him and said to him, uh, well, you know, chairman has asked to come and see me, what, what, what must I do? So the guy said to him, well, why don't you Google him? So he goes to Google, types in Ken Costa, and up comes God at work. turns to the guy next to him and says, flip, the guy's arrogant. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very pleased just to, to talk to you uh, this evening briefly about, uh, about God at work. You see, there is a sense at the moment, if we just look at the financial crisis that we've all been through, and we see the continuation of the uncertainty, that actually the confusion that reigns, the dislocation of the workplace, the dislocation of macroeconomics and, and the global world that we're on, it just looks to be such a confusing place that people would say, Do you know, the last thing we need is to have a complication by adding God or religion or any other thing into our lives. What we need to do is get our heads down and just get through this, uh, this period of time. But that ignores an extraordinary phenomenon. There are two things, I believe, that are happening at the same time. The first is a growing expectation that globalization is not just a passing phenomenon or good uh, in part, but is actually changing the very way that we think and the way that we respond uh, to um, different countries, different opportunities in a way in which we've never seen before. And secondly, that there is at the same time a huge increase uh, in what one might call faith or Christianity or, or Hinduism or Islam or whatever, whatever major faith uh, that there, there are. The editor of The Economist, John Micklethwaite, and The Economist is a weekly journal uh, not particularly known for its uh, favorable treatment to religion or to Christianity. It's a liberal journal. The editor of The Economist, John Micklethwaite, has just written a book called God is Back. Now, some of us don't think God has left, but his, his perceptive remarks is that worldwide there is a new surge of interest in religion. And that simply means that whether we like it or not, and people, many don't like it, we will have to review this increase of interest in faith as an important feature of the 21st century. In fact, my own view is that the 21st century will be 
characterized as, I hope, not a battle of the faiths or a clash of the civilizations, but actually ways in which that faith will come into its own in the marketplace, in the boardroom, in the political establishment, and in the economic field as well. And it is up to us to try and define against that background and against a very militant secularist move to try and define what is unique about the Christian faith that enables you and me to wake up in the morning knowing that when we go into our workplaces, we don't just leave at the doorstep everything that we hold important and dear to us, our whole, our whole existence, the way we think, the way we respond to people, the way we're motivated, and enables us to be able to define in that workplace an authentic and a distinct, distinctive Christian witness. And it's quite clear to me that one of the reasons why the church, at least in Europe and, uh, and in the UK, is, is so irrelevant today is precisely because it has got nothing to say to the people who come to the churches, a few and a dwindling few, but mostly those who don't, about how they spend the majority of their time uh, every day at work. And until we can recover that fact, the fact that my workplace and my workstation is also my worship station, we're called to a workplace. We are called to fulfill our worship to God in the place of our callings, in the place of our work, not just for an hour of enchanting and seraphic music on a Sunday evening or Sunday morning in a church. And I fundamentally believe that that is a core understanding that there is a calling. Without that calling, we will simply not understand the key purpose of being able to live as a Christian each day in the workplace. So I think one has to come back to uh, looking uh, at uh, the Bible, which I call the prospectus. You know, what was it? What was, what was there in that original prospectus that was the guide for our lives? Now, in the book, um, which I urge you to buy, not because I get any royalties, any of the money goes to Alpha, uh, but it is a practical attempt to deal with some of the big issues that we can't deal with tonight. Work-life balance, disappointment um, in the workplace, failure in the workplace, giving, uh, stress, um, the issues that you and I deal with every day. I don't have to tell you, and you don't have to tell me, that it is a stressful place to live at work. And it's even more stressful, some would think, if you put a religious brew into it. But actually, I think it's the opposite. I think it is that we're called by the Lord to live at peace. He gives us His peace. He gives us His peace in the middle of struggle, not just on the weekend. And that is a practice that you and I have to learn to appropriate, which is why I'm so deeply struck by um, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, which I'd love to read, chapter 12, which is so familiar to you, and I'd like to read it in the message translation uh, of the Bible. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Re readily recognize that what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed 
maturity in you. And I really do believe that. I believe that God brings the best out of us precisely in the area of the harsh commercial compromises that you and I have to reach almost every day uh, in, in our commercial world. And he prepares us in these ways. He prepares us through the reading of the scriptures. It's why um, uh, I talk in my, in my book, the opening paragraph, of saying um, I have for the most of my last 30 years read the Bible and the Financial Times almost every day. I won't tell you which I, re I read first. <laughs> but because you're very special, I will just tell you it is the Financial Times. So that we look to seeing both, you know, people will say, well, ah, yes, but, you know, um, of course it is the Bible and that's what matters. Well, yes, of course it matters. It's the prospectus. But actually, the Financial Times or the journal or whatever you read is actually informing us of what the world's anxieties are, of where the world is going, of the issues that are happening in the world, so that we might match these each day to an understanding of the wider context within which God wants us to operate. And for most of my colleagues, I believe, and for yours, are longing to find some understanding of this wider context. Something more than themselves. And there is no one to point the way, except you and me. Which is why, and don't, don't get me wrong, I do not believe that the workplace is the, that we're called to be evangelists in the workplace. It is true that I will make a good and reasonable defense of the faith that is within me, but I'm called at work to do a job of work. In my case, it is to be an investment banker. So that whenever you're working, you're drafting a document, you're a lawyer, you draft a document to, the, to accurately reflect the interests of the parties so that the truth might be enshrined in that document. That is a work of God that is being done. When you write your marketing memorandum and you balance how awkwardly sometimes it might be, the, true, the truth of the product that you're marketing with the natural expectation that you are selling something rather than writing a physical, a, 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 a physics treatise. Whenever you do that, you are working towards the establishment of good and of the truth. And people are longing to find a kind of something they know not. Let me give you an example which is, I, I always come back to. I was having lunch with a friend of mine who uh, was chairman of two of uh, our major companies. He was very successful. And he said to me, do you know, can I'm reviewing my life. He said, I've been successful. And he had been. He'd made some money. And he'd been chairman of these two major companies. He said, secondly, I'm looking at my relationships. He'd been divorced. And he said, I want to try and make sure that the family is kept together. So I've worked very hard at both families. And I think I put a tick in that box. And then he said, you know, in getting to the top, I've neglected my friendships. And I have taken time to work at the friendships. My friends from school, from the army, I've gone back to them and I've tried to reinvest in the people's lives who I've just passed on the way to the top. And then he said, that box is also ticked. He then said to me, he said, Can, there is one box. I don't really know what to call that box, but shall we call it spirituality? And I have a feeling that if I knew what was in that box, it would be the complete key to the whole of my life. I know that there is some emptiness in my day-to-day -day life. I just can't get it together and know that what I'm doing makes good sense. Do you know anything about it, he said to me. 
Well, I said, <laughs> don't want to turn down an invitation. And I was able to talk to him and share with him, you know, some of, of the very important issues about d working uh, in the workplace. And, you know, it is, it is really true for us to recognize that there is one integrated place. The Lord of Prayer is also the Lord of Profit. The Lord of Compassion is the Lord of Commerce. The Lord of Mercy is the Lord of the, Lord of the Money Markets. There is one indivisible Lord over all our lives. It is a nonsense to think that God is particularly interested, in our case, only in bishops rather than in bankers. What he is interested in is the people that he's called to the tasks that he has given who can ask him for the equipment that they need to do the day-to-day -day jobs that he's asked them to do. And there is no aspect of our lives. There is no private equity firm. There's no investment bank. There's no lawyer's firm. There is no media company. There is no accountancy firm. There is no economic system over which the Lord does not say mine. He brings them into existence and he gives us the stewardship of the resources that he has given you and me each day. And it's amazing how often we forget this. We forget that 16 of the 38 parables are about money. We forget the fact that 2,084 verses deal with money and finance far more than he ever spoke about heaven or hell. This is a practical Lord that we serve, a person who really understood people in their workplaces, in the difficulties that you and I would face each day. And that's why I think it is so important for us to recognize that we should be ambitious, as Jesus was ambitious in the work that we are doing, precisely because he has called us to exercise the gifts that he has given us to the best of our abilities. The parable of the talents, I remind myself of almost every day. The parable of the talents is a, is a story so topical for today of dealing with risk and reward. And not only just risk and reward, but also with faithfulness. And interestingly, when you read the parable, of course, the master went away for a long period of time. He left a long-term task. It was not turning to the intraday trader and said, here's some money, you know, work it for the day. At the end of the day, if you're up, well done, I'll give you more. It was over a period of time. He did not come back until after a long time. So when we look at what we've been given, we need to have, and it's so difficult in the workplace, isn't it, where we're always under pressure for short-term performance targets, trying to, trying to persuade people that we, you know, we can't work to that sort of pressure. That we do get for ourselves a long-term view for returning to the Lord what he has given to us in greater measure for the risk that had been taken. And of course, there's no other way, is there, for making an incremental return than by taking a risk. That's what he had to do. The person who got his 10 talents actually took a risk. He had to go and buy a boat, bought some fish, sold some fish. Boat sank, had to buy another boat. I'm always, if I, just as an aside, I'm always, whenever reading the, the, the parable, I'm really always struck and have deep sympathy with the guy who only got one talent. Because, you know, the guy who got 10 talents said, well, you know what? I'll take a risk on six and I'll keep four. And if it doesn't work, I've got some time, I'll invest the other four. The guy had one talent. I mean, he had to put it all on red. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, I mean he, he, he had to give everything. So I, had, I really have sympathy with him when he said, well, I'll just stick it in the vault. 
Um, and when he comes back, I said, you know what? I, I just couldn't step up to the plate. But the master was perfectly severe on him. What we have been given, we have been given in trust. We have been given in order that we might use all that he's given us. Wit, imagination, skill, analytics, wisdom, all of that. In order that each day might be honoring to the Lord who has called us to that particular workplace. Do you know, when we look back on the crisis, one of the things that will be undoubtedly true was that we were surrounded by knowledge. I mean, it was wall-to-wall -wall knowledge. We had more knowledge about every kind of security that you could imagine. We Not only did we have that knowledge, so much of it, we had it so rapidly. The chairman of the London Stock Exchange said to me, he said, well, we're having terrible problems with the Milan Stock Exchange. And I thought it was just the usual unhappiness with the Italians. But what, it, but what it was, was that they couldn't process the transactions quick enough. And when you bear in mind that the transactions were being executed at the speed of light, you realize just how amazing the world had become. Complex, rapid, uh, and a surfeit of knowledge. We became knowledge long and wisdom short. And that is the terrifying consequence. We need to recover a kind of wisdom, a wisdom which I believe comes from God, a wisdom which says that there are longer terms, that there is a right place for, for risk, that there is an assessment of return over a period of time a wisdom that actually takes into account a wider humanity, what I call the silent partners. And one of the major crises occurred because the boards of some of our banks, I speak of the UK, uh, were taking decisions based upon very myopic intra-organizational views without understanding that a bank operates in a community. It operates in a society. And that if we become detached from the society around us, there are going to be serious consequences. And that invisible or silent majority or silent partner is a very important factor that we need to bear in mind when we're making our decisions, when we're taking our, uh, executing the jobs that we're doing that there are social consequences to the activities which we undertake. Os Guinness, which, uh, who some of you might know, had a, has a wonderful phrase in which he said, you know, that the problem of our age, or the, and he wrote this some time ago, is that we've got too much to live with and too little to live for. Too much to live with and too little to live for. The current crisis has, however, questioned that first assumption, too much to live with. And the terrifying prospect now is unveiling itself in your country, in our country, and in Europe, is that actually there might not be too much to live with. And the fear is almost palpable. Now, how am I going to survive? How am I going to educate my children? How am I going to live with the fact that for the first generation, our children are, are expected, generally, not to have a life and, and a standard better than ours? How, how are we going to live with that? Or is this extraordinary opportunity for us to see a new awakening a spiritual and economic awakening. Because the crisis was not purely financial. It was financial, it was moral, it was spiritual. And therefore, to come out of this time is not merely quantitative or analytical. It will require an understanding of the spiritual and the moral dimensions of our humanity. 
wouldn't it be something that when we, in our workplaces, in the groups that we meet, uh, when we're talking, do we begin to understand that actually this is the moment to ask people, what is it that you're actually living for? And actually to be quite crude and cruel to ourselves. I regard it as vitally important that we become accountable to a peer in a small group, uh, which is one of the reasons why the Alpha course, um, sorry, the Alpha in the workplace or the God at Work course uh, has been written up to enable smaller groups of people in a bank, uh, in a lawyer's firm, uh, in a church to meet and to talk about some of these key issues so that we might learn to be accountable to each other and try and work out how it is that we could challenge ourselves as to the purpose of our own lives. What is it that we really wanting to draw out of my daily life? Is it simply the money? Or is there some other fulfillment of a challenge fulfillment of, of, of a dream or whatever it might be that is so important. I want to read, if I may, um, a description on this very important piece of purpose that I couldn't have uh, expressed uh, in any way as well as was done by uh, Professor Christensen in the Harvard Business Review. The Harvard Business Review is not normally, again, associated with the type of article that I will just read you an extract from. He talks about how will you measure your life? And, and this, is the, this is what he said. For me, having a clear purpose in my life has been essential. But it was something I had to think long and hard about before I understood it. When I was a Rhodes Scholar, I was in a very demanding academic program, trying to cram an extra year's work into my time at Oxford. I decided to spend an hour every night reading, thinking, and praying about why God put me on this earth. That was a very challenging commitment to keep, because every hour I spent doing that, I wasn't studying applied econometrics. I was conflicted about whether I could really afford to take that time away from my studies, but I stuck with it and ultimately figured out the purpose of my life. Had I instead spent that e hour each day learning that the latest techniques of mastering the problems of autocorrelation in regression analysis, I would have badly misspent my life. I apply the tools of econometrics a few times a year, but I apply my knowledge of the purpose of my life every day. It's the single most useful thing I've ever learned. I promise my students that if they take the time to figure out their life purpose, they'll look back on it as the most important thing they discovered in the Harvard Business School. If they don't figure it out, they will just sail off without rudder and get buffeted in the very rough seas of life. Clarity about their purpose will trump knowledge of activity-based costing, balance scorecards, core competence, disruptive innovation, which of course he was the, the expert on and written the classic book on, the four Ps and the five forces. People who are driven to excel have this unconscious propensity to underinvest in their families and overinvest in their careers. I think that's a, a profoundly succinct, coming from a professor of management studies, that I think we ought to take quite seriously for ourselves, that we ought to consider, you know, what is it that gives us the perspective and the purpose to our lives? Now, it's very easy to say, well, Jesus makes my is the perspective and the purpose. A absolutely he is. But, but what aspect of Jesus? Um, and the only way one does that 
is, I think, in the regular day-to-day -day recognition that we cannot operate without his help in the workplace. You know, people say to me, oh, it must be so difficult being a Christian at work. No, it's not difficult at all. It's impossible. <laughs> and, and that was Jesus' answer to, to the disciples. They said to him, well, oh, I mean, you know, you, you must be nuts, you know. We, we can't carry on like this. And he said to them, you know, he said, how, how is it possible anybody is going to be saved? He said, you know, with man it is impossible, but with God it is possible. Now, we do need the Spirit of God each day to enable you and me to remain energized, excited, um, you know, prepared to work, even on the tough, horrible days, particularly on the, on the tough, horrible days, knowing that there is a wider purpose to our calling. It is not just going to be tested as if it's some kind of index, you know, the sort of purpose index. Well, you know, I'm on four today, and I should be eight, and, you know, as if it were some, you know, VIX index or volatility or whatever. You can't measure it that way. But there is a sense in which you and I have to stand back and try and work out day to day a way of operating in the workplace so that we can be seen to be winning at work without losing in life. So often people say to me that, well, if you want to win in the workplace, you're going to lose out at li in life. Your family will go. Your motivation will be directed in another level. You'll become insensitive, greedy, all that. And the answer to that is yes. Were it not for the fact that we start by actually recognizing that we cannot cope on our own. We need help. We need help of the Spirit of God each day. And we need each other. We need each other. Which is why it is so good to be able to talk and to pray to, with friends or in groups within churches. But ultimately, it is a discipline. It's a discipline of praying or reflecting or meditating, whichever tradition you're from, or reading the scriptures, which is what I regard as, as a task for each day. Not very long, um, maybe short, short spells. If it's too difficult to carry a Bible around, iPad has made it much easier uh, to do. Um, you can take it with you, you can go traveling. It is important to have that encounter with God, a real encounter with Him, which comes, we cannot manipulate it. We can only put ourselves into a position where we can expect God to act. Do you know what I found so interesting in, in reading in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses is at the burning bush, you know the story. Moses uh, is tending the flock of, of Jethro, and he sees this unusual thing going on, a bush burning. And he moves forward to try and find out, well, what is it? The interesting thing about that story is that Moses was at work. He was tending the sheep. Now, for most people believe that you will have encounters with God in the sanctuary or in the church. Well, of course that happens, and thank God that it does. But actually, Moses' precedent is that the encounter with God can be as real, I don't think you get more real than that encounter, in the harshness of the workplace. Why? Because it is, it is God's field, it is God's work place. He has created these things. He's created us to work within them. That is the whole biblical truth. And therefore, it is possible to see God reaching to us, speaking to us in scriptures, in words, in pictures, in discussions with other people about the way in which our attitude should be shaped in the workplace. I remember an example from my own life when 
I was reading Psalm 112 one morning uh, when it says that, you know, that the Lord confides into the people who, who trust in him uh, and they do not fear bad news. And I read it. I had no reason to have fear bad news. Got into work and uh, my then boss called me and said, uh, look, this very important account that you've been running, we're going to make a change. Um, we're taking you off it. And I was absolutely gutted. You know, what was wrong with me? What haven't I done? Uh, I'm sure you never have those feelings. I'm sure you understand. You know, you know, I've done everything that I could have been. Tell me what it is and, you know, what it's like when in those situations. And, well, you know, um, and you sort of guess and you sort of expect something else has happened and you're filled with with, you know, negative feelings and annoyance and anger. You, you, know, you, know, you know this. But the fact of the matter was, I could remember that you would, he would not fear bad news. And there was an extraordinary resilience. I didn't know where it came from. It didn't come from me. My attitude was precisely the opposite. But that's the gracious God that we have. He meets us, helps us prepare to take on uh, the difficult things as they occur. Doesn't leave us without a counselor. Doesn't leave us without someone to support us uh, in, in, in the workplace. And I think we need to recover a certain flourishing in life, the joy of being able to work and to work with purpose. And that comes from the spirit who gives life I think we need to understand that in our work we add value to our society. The creation of value is a moral imperative for a Christian. As important as the distribution of the, of the result of that work. Sharing the benefits of our financial um, success is equally important. So people often say, well, yes, it is important to be responsive to the needs of others, but is it wrong to enjoy what I have? Because there's nothing worse than sort of guilty and uh, pessimistic um, Christian attitude. You may as well not, not have the faith if that's what you're going to do, because the Lord gives us all things richly to enjoy. He gives us good things. The way I answer that question is simply this, to talk about proportionate enjoyment. That, yes, it is right that you should enjoy the fruits of your labor in the workplace, but it should be proportionate to your understanding of the needs of others, your generosity in spirit, in giving of that money, and investing it in the church and the community in which you're operating or into people who are very needy or the marginalized of our society. And it's a huge liberation to be able to enjoy both. If you have the ability to, to have a, uh, a, a, a home where your family can be and people can meet in your home, you can use it for that purpose or be able to go on a holiday, whatever it is that you've worked hard for, it is good to enjoy what God has given us. But equally, we cannot do it without recognizing there's a proportionality, a kind of balance that actually enables us to enjoy it so much more when we are attentive to the needs uh, of, of, of others. Ted Turner famously has remarked that Christianity is for losers. And in some sense, of course, it may be. Because you have to determine the game you're playing. And if you're playing one game and want to play by the rules of that game, the chances are you will lose. But if one plays the game according to the person who created that very game, following the prospectus, and the way in which those are set out for us, for good living, for enjoyable living, for sacrificial living, and for the attentiveness to the common good 
of all the people with whom we meet, then I think the workplace is the most exciting place where anybody could be a witness for Christ. And I think it's precisely for that reason that he calls us there and equips us, you and me, to be able to be his witnesses in the very jobs that we are doing, rather than as some form of, of preacher in, in, the, in the workplace, in that very, very job. You know, that is why, as I, as I uh, have said, my workstation is also my worship station. And that is what St. Paul was trying to get us to understand. We do that if we lay our lives down for him in that way and do the tasks that he has called us to do with joy and equipped by the Spirit of God. He brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. And that, I think, is the exciting prospect that he holds for you and for me tomorrow uh, as we go to work. Thank you very much. I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you.